skip to this timestamp to get to the guide. Until then, here's an introduction to the development of this guide and its ethos. Progression in anything isn't always linear. We all start at the basics and then build upon them as we see fit. But eventually, we hit a ceiling. We don't always hit the same ceilings at the same time. As humans, we all have different personality traits and habits that reflect in our gameplay. Someone that could be Platinum in League of Legends, Valorant, or Overwatch may have gotten there because they have insane mechanical skill and can kill anyone they see. Others may have gotten there because they're just really good at playing the map and forcing the game to slow down to their pace. Or maybe someone is just really good at rallying a team together and making sure that cooler heads prevail. That's why when someone asks, how do I get to Diamond? Well, there just isn't a simple answer. Sure, we can generalize and analyze trends as to what separates a Platinum from a Diamond player, but eventually progression comes down to the individual and we'll need someone to help them point out their specific mistakes as a player, like a coach or something. So with that in mind, Left 4 Dead is maybe a bit more of a straightforward game, and as such, I'm going to attempt to explain the game and break it down in such a way that you will have all the information you'll need to get from advanced to expert difficulty. For credibility on who I am, I am Normstorm. I've played Left 4 Dead since the Left 4 Dead 1 demo, and honestly have barely touched verses in that time. But I've played almost exclusively expert campaign and realism during the lifetime of the series, and find it pretty easy at this point. Likewise, since the League Season 2 World Championships, I've been pretty hooked on esports and have loved watching League of Legends and CSGO mainly, but have also worked closely with Humber College's esports department during my time there, so I've also seen a lot of information and strategies to other titles like Call of Duty, R6 Siege, Smash Brothers, Rocket League, Valorant, even Shadowverse. So I've put together this guide to sort of pass on the knowledge I've accumulated during these last, you know, 10 to 13 years or whatever, it's been so long. But I put together this guide by playing through all 14 official campaigns on Expert, I paid attention to what my key and recurring thoughts were and talked about them when I found appropriate. I then amalgamated all my ramblings and key tips into a video and now making this one to serve as a final ultimate finished product to hopefully serve as a one-stop shop for anyone trying to play expert. And also I just wanted to share that actually just a few days ago I've adopted two Robo Dwarf hamsters and named them Zoe and Alice. Um, although I should have named them Alice and Zoe because Zoe currently has way more energy and hogs that hamster wheel more than Alice does. And quite frankly, it should be the other way around, and it's too late now. Anyways, I'm a personal believer that the jump from advanced to expert is the biggest difficulty gap in the game, and I think it comes down to the raw damage numbers and the deal to you. Sure, expert will guarantee more tanks and witches on average, but the damage that just one common infected does to you is 20 per hit and 10 from behind. Do you see this? This can happen to you numerous times on easy and normal before you get incapped. In advanced, you will get incapped the second or maybe the third time this happens to you. But expert, this happens to you once and you're down. This means that the game will not really forgive you for getting caught out of position, which means you are now forced to play a much smarter and strategic game. This is why every Left 4 Dead 2 player stresses the importance of staying together and keeping an eye on your teammates and shoving, and you'll see this as a repeated theme throughout the video, but hopefully we can get a little bit more in depth as to why that's the case. When we discuss game strategy, there's two schools of thought, micro and macro. Micro refers to what happens once you are in a fight whether it's a one-on-one -on -one with a special infected or clearing a wave of zombies. Macro is what the overall game strategy and objective is, and we're going to start with that because it's a bit more straightforward to explain. In Left 4 Dead, your team is trying to get from point A to point B. What is primarily attempting to stop you is both waves of common infected and waves of three special infected. What is important to know is that when a horde spawns and when the three special infected spawn are not dependent on each other. Sometimes you'll deal with one and then the other, or sometimes you will deal with both at the same time. It is important to note that a horde is not just when a lot of zombies in one area are just standing idly waiting for you to approach them, but rather when all or most zombies on the map, as well as a lot of newly spawned ones, rush to your team's location. This will always be accompanied by an audio cue. It is important to assume that while the game is trying to prevent you from reaching point B, it is often not trying to 100 to owe you right from the beginning but rather assume that every time you deal with a horde or the three special infected, that it's always going to take a little bit out of you. Ammo for certain, but might also force you to use a pipe bomb or your pain pills. If you're lucky, maybe your team loses no more than 60 damage combined. It's not just a matter of making sure that you and your team doesn't die, but that your team can take as little damage as possible with every fight that is being fought. This is where the broad scope of team economy will come into play, more specifically when are you using your healing items, a rule of thumb is that the most efficient way is to wait until someone is black and white before healing them, but exceeding an expert difficulty will come down to knowing when to break this unwritten rule, among other unwritten rules. More on that later, but the too long didn't watch is that mastery in Left 4 Dead and playing on expert will come down to knowing what to do in a variety of situations based on what's happening in front of you. And as such, 
knowing when to deviate from certain rules, which this video will do its best at preparing you for. Before moving to MicroStrategy, just a few quick notes on zombie hordes and economy tips. Often, there is a cooldown between when the zombie hordes spawn, but hordes will spawn faster the slower your team is progressing. So you need to sometimes decide that venturing off to the side closet for a chance at pain pills won't be worth it if a horde is then going to spawn on you and force you to use those pills immediately anyways, and also your ammo. As well, there is a cooldown on horde timers, but it all goes out the window once a boomer is involved, so you really want to make sure that the boomer is shut down. They can be especially deadly in the middle of a horde, or as soon as one ends, or during a tank battle. And finally, there's a maximum amount of common affected that can be on the map at any given time. So let's say you reach the roller coaster, and right as you're about to push the button, the horde spawns. It is more efficient to just push the button and start the event, rather than to fight that horde, use resources, and then summon the next one. Because of the maximum amount of commons that can be on the map, pushing the button right as the horde starts will not make you end up fighting two hordes at once, or one giga horde. All context dependent, of course, but you may find more often than not that the better course of action will be to just start it and get ready fast. So now let's go to the micro strategy. This will be a much harder topic to cover because there's a lot of different things that can go wrong depending on where you're fighting, your team's economy, what special infected you're fighting, so on and so forth. And things can go wrong very quickly. I've mentioned before that the game will not be trying to 100 to owe you right off the bat, but it very well can. The two main principles I try to work with are one, Make sure your team takes as little damage as possible, which can also be helped by doing two, kill as many zombies as possible. Making sure that your team takes as little damage as possible can come down to just killing a lot of zombies, but it's more than that. Ideally, you want to try to shut down the special infected as often as possible. If not keeping all three of your teammates in vision at once, at least keep in mind of where they are in the best route to get to them. Special infected will make a noise before attacking, which means you'll want to direct your attention to either where the source of the sound came from or towards your teammates. All zombies want to approach you. So if you're looking for a special infected, keeping an eye on your teammates is as good a strategy as any to finding what you're looking for. This will allow you to be ready and in a position to save your teammate without them taking any damage. We'll talk a bit about the specific type of special infected, but it's important to note that your priority in these situations is not killing the special infected, but making sure they deal as little damage as possible. For example, if you're standing next to a full health hunter that has pounced on your teammate, you will want to shove them before killing them. Otherwise, during the time it takes to deplete that hunter's health to zero with your gun, they may have done one or two ticks of damage to your teammate. This chunk of health can put them in limping health range, which can have ramifications later on. For example, having to take pills or getting outrun by a tank. Shoving will always be your best friend. It is a core part of the game and it's good to know that you can do a bit of a 180 shove like what you're seeing on your screen here. Whether it's saving your teammate from a special or common infected or making space for yourself, maximizing your usage of this mechanic will go a long way. But like anything, it's all case dependent. Here you see there's a situation where my team is having a good time fighting a horde on their own. It's hard for me to participate without accidentally friendly firing or jumping in front of their fire. So here I just watch behind to make sure nothing's flanking us. A simple maneuver that isn't winning this team fight, but more focused on securing the win. I mean, even here in this case, it was nothing, but still something that could really help out the team in another situation. The rest is being able to kill a lot of zombies. There's a lot of ways to do this, but it's good to know that there's a lot of bullet penetration across a lot of the weapons. So especially if you can get them lined up, whether it's standing on a ledge and they're climbing beneath you or getting them to funnel into a choke point, it's usually quite possible to line them up for an easier time. Other than that, you're going to be looking at good usage of your throwables. So from here, I think what I want to talk about is the three throwables in the game and then talk about the special infected and the rest of the weapons in the game before looking at some in-game examples. I have an expert weapon tier list video where I go more in depth with these, so I'll only communicate strictly what you need to know so you know we can save some time. Now, here you can see I rated the Boomer Bile the highest, then the Pipe Bomb, then the Molotov. However, all three of these are amazing and fill their roles perfectly. You can watch the video if you want rationale as to why I rated these the way they did, but it is important that they should all be viewed as equal. The Bile Jar got introduced to Left 4 Dead 2. It is your get out of jail free card and should be used as such unless you are in an event that requires you to run. The 20 second crowd control on the common affected is amazing for said running or during a regular fight to reset and let your teams revive, heal, and regroup so you can just figure out what's going on. Bile jars do spawn their own infected if there are not many on the map, so it's not recommended to use them willy nilly, especially during a tank fight. They will attack a biled tank, but if you do not kill the tank in 20 seconds, those infected will start prioritizing you as well. Now you're fighting both the tank and the horde. Bile jars also do not override Boomer Bile, as Infected will prioritize boomed survivors over anything else. Just be sure to kill the Infected surrounding the Bile Jar before the 20 seconds expire, if you can help it, unless you are running. Pipe Bombs are the counter to Boomers, but also with the added firepower of the Explosion. 
They are great for throwing into a room or to an open area to draw out common affected if you feel like there's potential to be flanked from multiple areas. If you also throw a pipe bomb towards a horde, they will 180 and run back towards it, which really helps your team. Just be sure to not throw a pipe bomb too far as infected won't be able to reach it before it explodes and then it's a bit of a waste. Also, it's a bit of Left 4 Dead etiquette if someone else throws a pipe bomb, don't shoot into their pipe bomb and steal their kills. Molotovs and subsequently gas cans provide amazing utility for blocking off corridors or burning down tanks and witches. Just especially an expert, fire hurts humans really bad and it can be quite the double-edged sword. Just use the fire but don't play with it and you'll be good. It is also worth noting for tank fights that fire damage stacks. But more specifically, if there are two sources of fire on top of each other, then the fire is going to do double the damage, but only when they are standing in that area where the two layers are overlapping each other. Then they burn down as normal after the fact. Now, now that we have utility out of the way, weapons are a bit straightforward, so let's look at special infected now and tips for dealing with them. It's hard to not look at tanks first. They will outrun anyone under 40 health. They are more or less the boss of each chapter they spawn in, but they are quite predictable. Notably, they switch aggro to whoever is closest to them, especially after they throw a rock. These rocks can be shot out of the air, but I don't really recommend it unless you really need to. They will always calculate the rock's location based on where you're going to go. If you keep moving in one direction, the rock will hit you every time, unless you change your direction right as the tank is about to release it. From there, they can be kited quite easily, especially with fire. As mentioned, I would not recommend a bile jar on a tank because of the subsequent horde you have to fight afterwards. However, if you do chain one or two bile jars a solid, you know, 15 to 20 seconds apart, that's actually usually all right because the infected can slow the tank down quite a bit. Now, tanks also can't really navigate corners and edges that quickly. So if you're below 40 health, you can use obstacles to your advantage. Be careful of flying cars and dumpsters. 20 melee hits will kill it. You know, my friend likes to finish long tank fights with a solid axe swipe or something. Infected will not spawn during a tank fight, but common infected will if there's a boomer or bile jar involved. And of course, punching the tank does not stumble it. The witch can be reliably taken out in multiple ways. Crowning with a shotgun is pretty straightforward. If they're standing, you can go directly behind or in front of them. If she's sitting, make sure she's standing up and then aim for the head and neck area. If you aim solely on the head, I think you risk some shells flying over her. You can also crown with a pump shotgun, but it's also very hard and I've never attempted it. If your team has explosive bullets, you can just mow her down and she'll infinitely stumble until she dies. Molotovs and kiting are also effective. If you headshot her with a sniper while she's sitting, she will stumble and your team can unload a lot of damage onto her, hopefully before she gets to you. Be careful, however, because this happened to me once where she moved her arm right as I was about to headshot her. So it didn't stumble her and I died because of it. I've also seen people solo her with fast melee weapons and I don't really know how to do that myself. If a witch is aggroed to someone, she'll stop chasing if they enter any safe house and run away. She will also run away if she kills someone. And generally, once she's in this state where she's running away, she'll just push people out of the way. But if you're directly in front of her, she'll kill you. If a witch is aggroed onto someone, you can actually make her switch aggro to you by lighting her on fire. Lastly, if you choose to not fight the witch at all, they're easier to run past when they're standing, but when they're sitting, I would recommend no more than having two people run past her at a time before letting her calm down and running past again. Just be wary that if you haven't fought a horde or special infected in a while, it's not uncommon for them to spawn on your team while you're split up and trying to get past her. Punching her does not stumble her. The charger is the best hard engage of any of the special infected. He cannot be stumbled with a melee attack. He has the highest health pool of all the special infected that are not the tank or the witch, and I don't know how it works, but during his charge, whether it's him gaining temporary health or increased damage reduction, he's able to absorb more bullets while charging. Try to sidestep him as much as possible. Once he has someone pinned, he will not let go until they are dead. To save a pinned teammate, either shoot him to death or hit him with explosive ammo to do an instant save. We've already talked a lot about the boomer and its ramifications on zombie hordes, but if the charger is an amazing engage, the boomer is a perfect follow-up. Sometimes it's better to ignore one or two things that your team is dealing with if it means making sure that the boomer is shut down. Melee him first, back up, then kill from a range when possible. Jockeys are the biggest menaces in the game. They cannot be reliably punched out of the air like a hunter can. It seems Valve really wants a jockey to be someone that can get damage off in as many situations as possible, and you basically have to melee them like before they jump to cancel their jump animation, which is a little janky. Even after all this time, if I'm in a solo or clutch situation, a jockey noise puts me on edge more than any other special infected. Either way, once a jockey has a survivor, they will ride them until the human is incapacitated. To save a teammate from a jockey, shove them, use explosive bullets, or kill. Hunters are easier to melee out of midair. Their damage numbers, however, are insane when someone is pinned, and they will not let go of a survivor until they are dead. It seems like hunters actually become squishy when they are in the air and it's easier to shoot them. I mean, here are endless clips of me headshotting a hunter out of midair because 
you really get used to it. Sometimes based on distance or angle, a hunter will actually pounce directly in front of you before pouncing on you, meaning you can melee it quite easily. To save a pin to teammate, shove, use explosive bullets, or shoot until death. Smokers can be very clutch in the right moments, but there's a lot of counterplay to them. First off, you can cut their tongues with sharp melee weapons if you have them. They will strike from a distance about, you know, 90% of the time. Once they have someone pulled, they become very squishy, nearly one shot most of the time. Sometimes in a fight, I'll just let a smoker hit my teammate just so I can instantly one shot it instead of having to shoot it three or, you know, five times depending on my weapon. A smoker will keep someone wrapped until they are dead, but in some cases the geometry is weird and the survivor won't actually take any damage at all. To save a wrapped teammate, melee the survivor, melee the smoker, use explosive ammo, shoot it, or shoot its tongue. Spitters are incredibly squishy and aren't really a threat at all by themselves. However, they do have to be respected as they are incredible follow-up during fights. If a team is grouped up in a tight area, a spitter is their worst nightmare. If not the damage of the acid increasing the longer you're standing in it, but just the disorganization that can come from everyone being forced to relocate on a pure instinctive level can ultimately lead to a team's downfall or make them take far too much damage. They can be punched or shot, however. For all special infected, I say that they spawn in threes, and usually they do. There are some small examples, though. For example, if you kill two special infected, but then the third one doesn't really show itself, uh, or, or if you attack it and it backs off, sometimes that third special infected will stay alive, and then another two will spawn later in a bit of a staggered interval, or sometimes they'll just die on their own so that the next third one can respawn. Either way, a universal tip for all special infected is that if you can help it, if you shoot one down a bit, but then it backs off, let your team know that. A simple smoker is half health, jockey should be very low health, will help your team a lot. For weapons, it's all pretty straightforward. I'll primarily talk about the pistols. At the end of the day, the Desert Eagle is the most reliable and can be used in all situations. I always recommend the Desert Eagle to anyone because its ability to still be accurate, pierce through infected, and still fire at the same rate while down has truly saved both myself and my teammates during clutch situations in countless playthroughs. Melee weapons as a whole are still fantastic when you are not incapacitated. They can dish out a lot of damage, especially in tight spaces. But once you're down, and again, this is a game where shit happens, right? Once you're down, the standard pistol is not reliable. It does not really penetrate common infected. It's inaccurate. It's slow. You need to shoot like three or four times before one infected dies. You got to keep reloading all the time. The dope pistols are also fairly similar when incapped. They're not very useful, but they are pretty useful and very fun to use, you know, when you're standing. Now, don't let any analysis on my weapons lead you to believe that any one weapon in the game is useless. Ultimately, everything works. Weapons aren't as important as your team's positioning and economy. That being said, snipers are obviously very good at long range. They can still be used in short range too because their bullet penetration is insane. The op and the scout, however, aren't as reliable because of the bolt action, but can still be effective if you play back a bit. In fact, it kind of forces you to stay back, and it's fine in most cases. I did have an expert Coldstream playthrough, which a lot of people, including myself, considered Coldstream the hardest campaign in the whole game. I had a run where we had four scouts. You're right, you know, anything's possible. I mean, a lot of secondary weapons were <laughs> being used. Um, now, in my tier list, I put the AK-47 at S+, plus and the military sniper at S, but I only did that because in all situations, I like both the AK and the sniper, but during a tank fight, I feel much more comfortable kiting with an assault rifle than a sniper. And the criteria for that tier list was overall flexibility. But that being said, for me personally, I find that the game is easier if you have at least one or two snipers on your team. The range is incredibly helpful for taking on special infected from anywhere at any time, especially through walls, and the penetration is just so good in all situations. Just be careful not to pierce your teammate with them. Assault rifles and SMGs behave the way you would expect them to. The SMGs are great at close range, but aren't as accurate long range and don't have as much bullet penetration, but you know, they can still be pretty decent at long range. Assault rifles are, however, just better than SMGs in every situation otherwise because they do more damage, they're more accurate, and they have more penetration. They're good at any state in the game. Shotguns, obviously the tactical and automatic shotguns are more effective than the pump and chrome shotguns. The friendly fire is insane though. They can one-shot your teammates easily, but as you'd expect, you know, they're insane close range, very easy and effective for running through events and frontlining. Can still take out a special infected from a range, but you'll find yourself having to shoot about four to seven times. If you run a shotgun, remember to crouch during events when you are in front of your team so that they can shoot above you. M60 is brutally effective during the 150 bullets you have when you do have it. I'd recommend at least one person pick it up if you can, but it's not that necessary. They will one-tap any infected and pierce, and will mow down anything you fire at, really. Grenade launchers require some thought to it, and it isn't crazy effective. I find you can get the most use out of it by shooting into a horde from a range during an event, but its usefulness kind of ends there, but it is still fun to snipe special infected with it, and actually during a tank fight, you can fire it through a tank rock and into the tank to kind of parry it. 
more or less. It's also just very fun for tank fights if, you know, you're playing for fun, which hopefully you are. Health kits and defibs are both fairly obvious in their general use and their role in team economy, as I've touched before. There's a debate on if sometimes should you just kill your teammate and revive them instead of using the med kit. My answer is personally, I like to go through med kits first before using a defib. I prefer to not really use them unless, you know, you really need to. But honestly, either approach works. In fact, you know, during an event, it's easier to heal your teammate because they can still fight and protect you, whereas a dead body or defibbing in the heat of battle can't do that. I can also definitely say, though, that there's absolutely times where you should use a defib as a med kit, usually before an event and you have no other options, you know, especially if someone is black and white and most of your team is limping. It is important for the sake of your team economy that you should have at least two people at running speed if you can help it, because mobility is crucial, especially for tanks, which is in, you know, clutch moments as a whole. Speaking of clutch moments, pills and adrenaline. For economy's sake, I like to use the pills for your general all-encompassing health reasons. Adrenaline should definitely be used for clutch situations if you can help it. And I think it's obvious it's designed for that use. Less health recovered overall compared to the pain pills, but you run much faster, water no longer slows you down, faster revives. I see this being approached the wrong way in a lot of my games. So let me put it plainly. If you are, let's say, 60 health or below, you have an adrenaline, but then come across pills. Consume the pills, then pick up the adrenaline again. In this situation, using your adrenaline for basic sustain wastes the benefit of the increased use and move speed that you could be using later. Then for utility bullets, explosive bullets can be a bit of a double-edged sword, strictly use them from a range, and the ability to stumble special infected will be very, very beneficial. Fire bullets are great for tanks and marking special infected, just be careful on witches and the way they'll re-aggro, but also know that usually in most situations, someone will put fire bullets down, everyone uses them at once, and then all the burnt bodies on the ground will actually kind of impede your vision for a bit. Just be wary of that. Otherwise, turning all of your weapons into one-hit kills is pretty cool and also helps you save your normal ammo. So that's micro and macro strategy, the throwables, special infected, and weapons. Before we go to the concluding thoughts for this video, I want to leave you with two very important pieces of information. First is what I like to call CSGO theory. You see, in other games like your Valorants, your Overwatches, your League of Legends, hell even back for blood, and yes, I say it, you have characters whose kits very clearly define a role for them. Tanks, mages, frontliners, backliners, supports, etc. You know, by selecting one of these characters, you lock yourself into that role for your game. However, in a game like Counter-Strike, everyone has access to the exact same items at all stages of the game. But yet, if you ever watch professional Counter-Strike, you'll see that players still fulfill specific roles like Entry Fragger or Lurker. Left 4 Dead obviously is much closer to a game like Counter-Strike, where you have access to everything at every time. And as such, sometimes you will find that you need to either play protective for your teammates or play more aggressive and be that slayer that every team needs. Try to keep this in mind when you do your playthroughs. You can play offensively or defensively with any weapon in the game. The choice is yours, and usually there isn't any one specific answer for every situation that happens in the game. It comes down to you, your comfort, and your decision making. But no matter what is thrown at you, there's always something that you can do to either make your team win the fight or something that you can do to just be the final nail in the coffin. But as well, I don't see it often, but I do see it sometimes. Don't take this game too seriously, all right? There's no ranked ladder, everything works, and even if your team gets stuck and has to go back to the safe house a number of times, it's all good, man. Don't rage, don't type unhelpful things. It's not going to help anyone. You know, I've respawned in safe houses a hell of a lot more times than I've seen the end screen credits. You know, it's just part of the game. So really quickly, here are some in-game examples that sort of amalgamate everything I've talked about previously and then some, because like the real world, your experience is mainly going to come from actually doing rather than reading or watching information. In this spot here, it's powerful because it has high ground and forces infected to follow a fixed linear path to get to me. This lines up a lot of collateral shots that alleviates pressure from my team. In this situation, I am incapped, but I am focusing on trying to look at and cover my teammates because it is a clutch situation and it is more important that they stay alive so that they can help me up. Otherwise, they can get incapped and we're forced to restart. In this situation, I realized that the horde was going to pinch us from both sides of the tunnel. So with the bots, I relocated to this corner so that they can't come from behind us and as such becomes a safer fight and easier for all of us to look out for one another. With humans, you will see this a lot. Things just generally being scattered. I like to try to be the glue that just knows where everyone is and position in such a way that I know exactly where to get to each teammate should something happen to them. In cases like this, during this pandemonium, just find one teammate and stick with them. Here I chose Lewis because not only was he the closest to me, but he was also in between Bill and Francis. So once we were established as a good middle ground, it opens up options to help others or help others come to us. A more map specific note, 
But for Dark Carnival Chapter 4 event, you can save throwable economy by taking one of the spawned gas cans here and drop it right in the center of this crack. Usually it'll land straight down without bouncing, and the end result will be that the fire reaches all four sides of the scaffold, making Affected unable to climb up, period. It can save you a good Molotov or pipe bomb or two. You've probably seen this a fair bit. It's not uncommon for a lobby to get to an event and they just decide to just keep running instead of stopping to fight the infect at some point. This is risky, as you can see here, because we didn't deal with the tank first. The tank is in front of us, horde is behind us. What do we do? We kite back towards the infected and kill them before focusing attention entirely onto the tank. Okay, two different situations, same advice. First situation is there's a lot of sections in the game where there are trees that block your view a lot on the sides. It makes it easier to walk forward and then a bunch of zombies come from all angles. The second situation, we have to run to the safe house, but the infected are piling up in front of us. What do these two situations have in common? What's common is the best approach is two steps forward, one step back. Gain the forward positioning as often as you can, but don't just dive head first into it. You'll die. Sometimes just kite back a bit to draw them out or stop so that you can just fight and clear the infected before continuing onwards. Here, a dark room, they can flank from all angles, Moving slow because of the water, stick with your teammates and keep your head on a swivel. Here, two teammates are down while Lewis and I are still up. Here, my priority is protecting Lewis. We can both protect Bill and Francis, but Bill and Francis can't protect us. I can only be protected by myself and Lewis. Lewis can only be protected by himself and me. Protect Lewis so we can both protect Bill and Francis. Simple as. Here, Nick went a bit too far ahead and got in capped. I'm not gunning straight for him because it isn't necessary. There's no way we get team wiped here anyways, but taking it slowly, clearing out the area and not overextending to just see what the general situation is and ensuring that it's safe to get Nick up. As we mentioned here, a lot going on, special infected all around, Jockey ends up on Ellis, so I prioritize the special infected immediately, then I reposition and regroup in such a way so that I can see all three of my teammates. Now, less about specific situations and more about overall encompassing tips. When Bill says first to aid, last to die, that's just cope and seethe. If you heal first, you're just the first person to use the medkit. That's it. Assuming everyone takes damage at the same rate, you'll actually die first if you're the first one that needs to heal. Don't cope like Bill. Take as little damage as you can in 99% of situations. By pulling out any healing item, you can force the bots to stop healing you. With a human, you can click on take a break to cancel the animation as well. If you've searched a room and have confirmed nothing's in there, I like to close the door behind me in case, you know, infected spawn behind. They might end up in that room and then have to take time to break out first. If you get griefed, I don't know about Xbox, but on Steam, if you're able to just open the recent players tab, you can find their Steam profile and block them, and they'll never be able to join your Left 4 Dead game ever again. When playing with bots, just know that they're programmed to stick together and to be very good turrets, but Special Infected make them derp and process things most of the time, so they aren't very good at clutch decision making and sometimes don't realize that they need to save you from a Special Infected. So that's the gist of it, but sometimes they'll teleport to you to save you or even crown a witch. Do what you can to protect them, you know, try to use them as bait a little bit, but don't be afraid to heal them if you think it makes sense to. If you see static spawns, if you pick up said spawn, then re-pick up the item you dropped in its place, the original item will go back to that original spawn. But if you run and or jump backwards while picking up that item, your item will drop fairly far from that static spawn. And if you continue this, you can end up juggling two items for the same slot at once. This is helpful for bringing items into the next chapter or for setting up before an event or just making it so that your teammate can't miss it because it isn't uncommon for teammates to be indifferent to items and simply just not pick up whatever item you call out. When holding out in a finale, special infected like to come from the same spawns as before. So if you're holding out here and you see a spitter from a direction, keep note of that because it's often that the spitter will come from that exact same spot again next time they spawn. Same as smokers, hunters, you name it. Alarm cars can be shot from a long distance without having their alarm triggered. Son of a bitch. So we've covered a lot of ground with this video. Myself, Zoe, and Ellis all thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I also hope that you think it's good enough to send to your friends or to anyone you see on the internet asking for tips on how to improve in this game. If there's something I missed, please put it in the comments so that this can be an area of you know, just really good, helpful advice. I tried to cover as much as I can, but there's always something that someone knows that you don't, right? When I've made my recent Left 4 Dead 2 content from my why Left 4 Dead 2 players rejected back for blood video to my tier list to this, it's genuinely all just been passion projects. I don't really care for, you know, likes and subscribers and all that. But as I made these videos, I realized that there's still a lot of other topics that can be talked about. 
And I'll be honest, I don't watch other Left 4 Dead 2 content. So I'm sure there's a lot of other great topics and strategy videos out there. But if there's a question you have about the game or a topic you think you'd like to see me talk about in a future video, you know, let me know if you think that's, you know, something you'd be interested in. Honestly, I'll think about it. You know, I do have a full time job in life outside of these Left 4 Dead 2 videos, so it isn't the highest priority. But when I think about it, I feel like breaking down campaigns or going over traditional and unconventional holdout places, you know, difficulty tier lists, you know, that could be a pretty fun topic to dive into. But yeah, besides from that, thanks again. Hope you're doing good and good luck out there. I got my bile jar. Just keep, just keep hugging the wall. Also in black and white. Oh, God, help me. Shoot the hunter. Play okay. Damn it. No, no. Oh fuck. It's okay. It's okay. Norm's got this. Norm's got this. Norm, you have to you have to look at it though. You have to look at the safe room or else they're gonna start spawning it. I was about to say amateur move, dude. Whoa! Wow, Norm, good job. Smash pet. Punched him. No, that was supposed to go over you. It's such a weird. That, <laughs> up the that, is, that is the most interesting horde mode I've ever I... seen. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Oh. I don't know, maybe. No, I'm down. Wow. No. Oh. No. Can't say anything. Kick him, kick that. Oh. Oh no! no! Oh my god! Shit! Close the door on right Oh no! No! What the fuck? <laughs> what? Oh, okay, no, they fixed it. Norm, that was in Lefford at 1, not Lefford at 2. I really like it. Oh, shit. Wow, the timing of this smoker. There is no uh, fun. All right, where are we holding out? Oops. Stop shooting people! <laughs> we don't have health kits. <laughs> guys gotta stop being so toxic. Guys, stop being so toxic. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> My pills, fuck you. Get this flat! <laughs> <laughs> I will turn this game around. <laughs>